Spirit of God has given us this month as our month of intimacy to focus on being intimate with Him. So blessings and love to you all in this month of April. And the reason is is so that you can go safely across, not only in your transition, but I believe it's a word for life. It's a word for, you know, your future, not just your now or your present, but your future. It is a word to the body of Christ. You know, we have to build the bond of intimacy so that when everything is shaken, that can be shaken, which it tells us in the book of Habakkuk, Hi guys, sorry. It tells us that everything that can be shaken will be shaken. However, he says that the glory of the latter house or the latter temple shall be greater than the former. And so for you to be able to stand when a lot of things are falling, when a lot of things are being seeming to be unstable, when there's a lot of fast moving changes, even in your life, in your family, in your marriage, with your children, or whatever else you may be facing or be confronted with, it is important to know that when that happens, your solid rock is Jesus Christ. You know, on Christ, the solid rock we stand. All other sand, all other ground is sinking sand. And you see, we sing that hymn, but it is true. A time comes whereby even those that you thought would stand with you don't, or even those you thought would support you don't, or even people that want to or have a good will and intention towards you are simply unable to be there for you at that time. And you must know that the Lord is with you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. You must know he knows the way that you take. And that is what the patriarchs had. They had intimacy and they went through great trials. They went through tribulation. They went through persecution. They went through injustice. Excuse me, but every one of them came out to victory and to triumph because of intimacy. And who better to take our example from than Jesus? Even Jesus had intimacy as the foundation of the relationship that he had with the Lord. Amen. And one of the blessings the Lord showed me yesterday, um, you know, as I was worshiping and just giving him the glory and thanks for everything he had done, because I was listening to a song and I remembered it was actually Ron Connolly. And Ron Canoli went to a church um, in Lagos, I think, I think in Lagos or in Nigeria. And he sang some of the old songs that he used to sing. And so I was remembering, because when I was first saved, Don Moen and Ron Canoli were the two men of God that the Lord was using at that time. I'd never heard praise and worship. To be honest, I'd heard hymns, but I didn't know about praise and worship. So we didn't even know things like the lyrics of a lot of what they say are taken from the Bible. So it took us to read the word of God to realize, oh, these lyrics are from the Bible, you know, you know, so even things like that, we didn't know. But I just remember he's now 80 years old, standing up for one hour, giving God praise and glory. Everyone was shocked. One hour, the man of God went through the worship set alone with the backing, backing singers, you know, and with the band. And I was like, Lord, everybody was like, at 80, he was dancing at 80. And so I was just remembering where I was when I told my dad that I was saved. And he came to a concert with me to, with Ron Canoli. And so when he sang that Jesus is alive, I remember running because we were at the back of the stadium and something might, but I just ran, you know, the length of the stadium and I ran to the front. And I always remember how I had that reaction, you know, to um, Ron Canoli. And then I bought all the albums, And so I was thanking God because the Lord was like, think back to where you were. Think back to the same songs you used to sing to me and where you were. And now look at where you are. And it gives you such a sense of gratitude, such a sense of gratitude that the Lord is with you in season and out of season. He's with you through every season, through every stage. You know, there's a scripture that says, even from your young age, he will carry you even up to old age. Amen. So he's with you in every season at every stage. And it proves his faithfulness that it's not just when you're going through the good times or it's not just when you can see your way forward, that the Lord will literally progress your life. But at the time, it doesn't look like progress because you're going through pain. It doesn't look like progress because you're going through confusion. But when you look back, you can see how far he's brought you. And then you can really, really and be grateful for what is done in your life. Amen. Even though the surroundings may change, the environment may change, the circumstances may change, but the Lord is still the same. And so that's where I was yesterday when I was giving him the praise. But one of the things that he put in my heart, he said, you know, one of the reasons why Jesus could really trust the father to be um, sacrificed is because he has such a relationship with the Lord that he just believed as long as he maintained righteousness, the father would resurrect him. It was an act of trust. It was an act of faith. 
And that's why when you see Apostle Paul in Galatians saying that he wished that he may be cut off in order for his um, brethren, according to the flesh, the Jewish people, to be grafted in. He too had come to that place. I said, wow. As I said, think about it. Why would anybody think to themselves, let me die in place of somebody else, you know, so they can live? It is because they trust in the Redeemer that if I live righteously enough before him, he has the power and the will and the heart to resurrect me. He will not allow his Holy One, the Bible says, to see corruption. He will not allow your soul to see corruption in Sheol. You see, that is the trust level. So when you have that trust level, and the Bible says we overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony, and we didn't love, they didn't love their lives unto death. That is the intimacy level. That is not because they want to die. That is because they believe that even if they die, they will live. They believe that my Lord will resurrect me. And that is what happened to Abraham. Remember? Because when Abraham was tested, sacrificed your son, the Bible says that he believed that somehow, even if he killed him, God will resurrect him. Where does that faith come from? Intimacy. That faith is not taught. It is caught in relationship. It is caught when you have a relationship with the father so strong that you understand his character. This is what allowed Moses to tell the Lord, if you would not go with us, I don't want to go. Or if you will not forgive the people of Israel, blot me out of your book. He said that knowing that the Lord will not let him go. So that was his way of securing God's favor over the, um, the children of Israel when they sinned against God. Because he knew that the Lord would be like, but I can't let you go. Because the Lord would never allow those he loved so much and the righteous to, be go, to, to let them go. Even when we sinned against God and we were separated, look, he came after us. He came after us. Amen. So he just dropped it in my heart. And it's just a word of encouragement, really, for you to know that building intimacy, it delivers dividends. Building intimacy is going to give you the absolute persuasion and conviction of who the Lord is to you. And it's going to show you that there's no power. Like Apostle Paul said, there's nothing present. There's nothing past. There's no angel. There's no demon. Amen. There's no principality that is able to separate me, neither life nor death, nor angels, nor anything is able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. These statements were made by experience. They were not made, you know, as a theological argument. They were made born out of experience. And the best authority or the best impartation of anybody's life into your life is always coming from people who have had an experience with God. It's the experience with God that we read in the scripture. It's the experience of people's faith. It's the experience of what they believe God to do that is now written down as a record for us to learn from. So experience matters. What is your experience? That's what you can hand to somebody. It is your testimony of what you've experienced of Jesus that you actually give to someone else. Amen. You can give them a 100% perfect theological argument as to why Jesus is Lord. But when you have an experience, you're going to add in some ingredients. You're going to add in some flavor that only you have because you have an experience. And that is what really um, fuels the gospel. The gospel is not just, it's doctrinally correct. Yes, it is. But the gospel is the power of God unto salvation because it is fueled by people having a living testimony of who God is and what Jesus did for them. And nobody can argue with their experience. The man said, listen, I don't know who the person is. I was blind and now I see. Do you want to become his disciple also? He didn't even know the name of the person. He just knew this person healed me. And I was blind from birth. And they kept on asking him. And he said, listen, why do you keep asking me? I, you can't deny I was blind. Now I see. So when somebody has an experience, there's no argument against your experience. There's no argument. You, people can argue doctrine. They can argue theology. They can argue scriptures. They can't argue experience. <laughs> they can't argue testimony. You see, they can't argue it. Glory to God. Amen. So this is why I believe there are many reasons, but these are all some of the reasons why taking time to be intimate with God pays. It really does pay. It refreshes you. It refuels you, but it reaffirms everything you are to him and everything he is to you. And also it reveals more of God to you, more of who Jesus is to you. And it makes you a firm 
gives you a firm foundation that you stand on so that when everything is being shaken, you're not going to be part of those, amen, that is shaken out or is shaken off because you know where you stand. You know whom you believe. You're fully persuaded. So you become part of those, amen, that become immovable, that become, what did he say? He said, um, be steadfast and immovable. Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing it is from him that you shall receive a reward. All right, praise the Lord. So the word of the Lord to you today is the Lord is the Lord shall redeem what you lost in formative years through your marriage. He's redeeming what was lost in formative years through your marriage. What a word. And this word it gave me yesterday. Now we know this is the year of the bride. And we know this is the year of divine settlement. And I've spoken at the beginning of the year that the Lord is saying he's going to settle you as, as a reward. He's going to restore. He's going to recompense. He's going to rest the So that is all part of what this message is about. But I think the, the emphasis he gave me last night was that, do you know that it's not just the fact that he's going to bless you with your marriage, but the person you marry on both sides, on male and female, is specifically set up to redeem and to restore what you lost informative years. So God is using marriage to release and to restore what the devil stole from his people in their formative years. Now, formative years could mean in your childhood. It could mean in your adolescence. It could mean in your teens. It could mean in your early adult years. It could even mean in former relationships. It could mean opportunities. Formative years could mean when you began business and it failed over and over because of the environment or because of resource or you didn't have the enough help or support. Whatever it means, formative years or former years, this is what the Spirit of God gave me. He said he's redeeming what you lost, amen, through your marriage. He's intentionally set you up and set up the men and the women in these supernatural marriages, in these kingdom marriages, in order for them to be restored in, in the area of what was lost and what the devil stole in formative years. Glory be to God. So Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we say thank you, Lord, for just allowing us to understand you, to come closer to you, to seek a deeper connection. Thank you for building intimacy with us. Thank you for bonding more with us. Thank you for your presence, Lord God, that you've and your presence that um, we are in and also your presence that is released upon our lives on a daily basis in the name of Jesus Christ. And I say thank you, Lord God, for redeeming everything that has been lost through in our formative years, through our marriages. We give you glory that you think about everything. We give you glory that you're a God that restores. You're a God that redeems. You're a God that rescues. You're a God, Father God, that recompenses, that restitutes. And we say thank you, Lord God, for appointing us not only to have a supernatural marriage, not only to have a promise of marriage, not only for the prophecy to be fulfilled, but also, Lord God, to restore and to redeem everything that was lost in our former years. I give you glory, Lord God, for the women and for the men who this applies to in the name of Jesus Christ. And I give you glory, Lord God, that you are causing your church and you're causing the bride of Christ to be restituted based on everything that she has lost in Jesus' name. I pray the blessing of this word upon every hearer in the name of Jesus and every man and woman, Heavenly Father, who has really stood to seek you for their marriage in Jesus' name. I pray that you restore the years you restore the opportunities. You restore the, the um, provision. You restore the grace. You restore the experiences. You restore the joy. You restore the peace. And everything that the enemy has stolen shall be restored sevenfold to your glory. In the name of Jesus, we are prayed. Amen and amen. It is so beautiful, people of God. It is so beautiful. So he was saying to me that he's not only positioning you for marriage, you are getting ready and he's prepared you to enter into your supernatural marriage. And as a ready bride, as he already confirmed to us, amen, he said, just be ready and stay prepared. Glory to God. However, the Lord was saying that, do you know that I set things up in such a way, especially for men and for women who have lost much in former years and formative years to ensure that the hookups or the unions that God has appointed for your life, amen, have already factored in your formative years, the losses sustained in formative years. And I've explained formative years right from the day you're conceived up until your present day in the name of Jesus Christ. Secondly, 
He's positioning us to rule and to reign through the marriage. Now this we know from Revelations 5, 9. Amen. We know that he's positioning us. He created us to be kings and priests unto God. He made us kings and priests unto God. And the Lamb of God redeemed us according to Revelations 5, 9 to 10. Sorry. Revelations 5, 9 to 10. And it says, so we shall rule and reign on the earth. So also he's using marriage to position you to rule and reign through your marriage. Number three, he's promoting you in order for you not to have to rebuild or build at a, um, I say at a slow pace or build, amen, in order for you to catch up, in order for you to catch up, he's promoting you through marriage for you to be positioned in the places, in the platforms and with the people you're supposed to be in if you have never been disrupted or delayed. Isn't that incredible? I was like, wow. And so he's presenting you to a man, to your husband, or if you're a man, he's presenting you to your wife and to women who can take you somewhere. This is all part of the reason why the Lord really desires for men to choose in the word of God and for women to choose in the word of God. Because one of the things he showed me is that many people choose according to their own thinking. They choose according to where they're at. They choose according to their preference, or they even may choose according to what they believe can assist their purpose. But if you don't choose in the word of God, the enemy can still shortchange you because the enemy does not know, amen, to the capacity, the capacity that God has and God desires to actually redeem the formative years. Not everyone is able to take you to that place or has the resource within them and within their destiny, within their mind, within their personality to be able to redeem the formative years, the things that were lost in formative years, the connections maybe, because you see, everybody needs something different. And so I just put down here, let's just go down through the word of God and let's just see some of the things that were stolen and then it will help you to work out what needs to be restored. Amen. I think that's important. So in Joel 2, in Joel 2, it tells us in verse 25, so I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, and the chewing locust, my great army, which I sent among you. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never be put to shame. And that's in Joel 2, 25 to 26. And so you see here that the Lord is saying there are years that have been eaten away and they've been eaten away by the locusts and the locusts ate away the harvest. So he's saying he permitted it. All right. Because we all know there has to be legal ground for these things to happen. However, the Lord is saying he's still mindful that in restoring your life and in redeeming your marriage and in redeeming your legacy, you have lost many things in formative years. And then it has cost you and it has cost the kingdom. Don't forget whatever cost God's people, cost him. And remember Revelation 3, I'm um, sorry, Acts 3, 21. It tells us that Jesus has been seated at the right hand of the father. And it says, whom heaven must receive until all things are restored. Or all things are restituted back to him and put under his feet. And so we are that generation that the Lord is using to redeem, to restore, to restitute all things back to the Lord Jesus Christ and put them under his feet. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Glory to God. So what have has been lost? Just think through from Genesis. I think that's the easiest way. And then we'll look at the story of um, Joseph and then Abigail. But truly, I was looking through at, at the, the bloodline of Jesus Christ. And that's what led me to the message as I was just studying the bloodline. And I went to, to find certain things out about the individuals in the bloodline. That is when the Spirit of God whispered this word to me. That do you know I'm going to redeem I'm going to restore the what the, the losses that people have been sustained through their formative years, through their marriages. And so I, I'm picking individuals intentionally. I'm picking certain types of people intentionally because the people must be able to take you somewhere. Imagine they must be able to take you somewhere and take you somewhere is based on what was stolen. So in the Garden of Eden, we know that when they fell, they lost their domain. Is that not right? They lost their influence and their domain. And so they were in the presence of God. Adam and Eve were in the presence of God. And then obviously they lost their domain and their, the image of God was corrupted. They also lost their relationship with God. 
They had one, but they no longer have the intimacy, right? Their intimacy with God was damaged. Their intimacy with each other was also damaged, destroyed. Division came in. Blame game came in. All of these things we see in Genesis 2 and Genesis 3, okay? Now, I call it the sweet spot. Genesis 2.25, it says, I'm the man and his wife were naked and unashamed. That was the sweet spot they were in at the end of Genesis chapter two. So at the end of Genesis chapter two, they were in the presence of God. They were in each other's presence. He now had his help me comparable to him, suitable and comparable to him. He had the provision. The next one was the the blessing, which is the power and the influence and the dominion, which is Genesis 1, 28. They had the provision. Remember, it says that there were four rivers in Revelation, in Genesis chapter two, the four rivers that went out and then of the, of the, of the garden. And we talked about those four rivers. Okay. The river um, Pishon, the river Gihon, Hezekiel, and the river Euphrates, and what they stand for in the former message that I had. And then returning back to Eden. Okay. So all these things, provision they had. And provision stands for access. Provision stands for opportunities. Provision stands for resource. Provision stands for protection. All right. All of these things were there. Protection. Provision stands for um, um, enablement. All of these things they had. And they lost them when they lost the garden. They had partnership. They had the partnership of God. They had the partnership of each other, which is marriage. They had purpose. They had intimacy. They had union. All of these things were stolen when they fell from grace and when they entered into sin. They had peace. They had health, peace in their health. They had wealth, peace in their relationships. They also had mental, emotional, and psychological well-being. Peace. Peace of mind. No anxiety. No fears. No worries. No shame. So when you start breaking it down, you see, oh, a lot of things were lost and a lot of things were stolen the minute sin came in to matters. We even look at the example of Cain and Abel. And so by the time you get to Revelation chapter um, four, you see that the firstborn killed the secondborn. So they never, they didn't even have peace in their family. The family bond and the family unity, they just began to be dysfunctional. One killed the other because Satan Amen. Is a murderer and a thief from the beginning. And so he stole, he murdered, he sabotaged, and all of these things were the outworkings. And so all of us have suffered in our formative years. Even the formation of creation has suffered as a consequence of what happened to Adam and Eve. Legacy, family, fruitfulness, all of these things were stolen. So God is saying that he's literally putting people back together in his world through marriage, He's putting you back into your personal Eden, but also he's mindful, not only of the place, but the people and the person he's assigned to you in order to make sure that what you lost personally on both sides in your formative years is restored. Whether you lost it in your childhood, whether you lost it, like I said, in your adolescence, whether you lost it in a former relationship, in former marriages, maybe, whether you lost it, amen, in your um early um, adulthood, whether you lost it for lack of union, lack of power, lack of presence, lack of provision, partnership, peace, legacy, whatever circumstance you were put in that caused you to lose out on what God has ordained for you. The Lord is saying through marriage, he's redeeming it and restoring it back to your life. Isn't that incredible? That is incredible. So this is why he's saying it's so important for us to understand that Marrying in the will of God counts. And he brought me back to the message about the weddings, about the power, the blessing of the wedding day, the power, the glory, and the honor of the wedding day. And that is something that's very, very vital for people to understand. Now, for Gideon Warren, you know that that's our gift to you. Okay. And so you'll get that gift. And we've got someone now working on that so that that will all be done for you. Okay. So you will have that. But this is the reason why the Lord is doing a greater work than any of us understand. He's not just putting people together for love's sake. He's not just being put to people together for purpose sake. He's not just giving you a purpose mate. He's also mindful of what you lost. He's mindful of the things that were taken away from you, of the opportunities. One of the things he put in my heart was opportunities because he was reminding me of my husband. There were opportunities that he had lost along the way that were now restored when we got remarried this time. 
you know, there's blessings, children, experiences, lost seasons, lost times, lost hopes, lost dreams. All of these things are being restored back to you through your marriage. God is a creative father. And so he wants you to know that he has created an opportunity again, not only for you to be married, but for you to experience everything you should have experienced the first time around if the enemy had not entered in, or if you had not deviated, or if there was no derailment, or there's no sabotage, or there's no delay. That's why he named all of this kind of locust. Because he said there was a chewing locust, there was a swarming locust, there was a consuming locust, there was a crawling locust. However it came in, he's saying however the damage came in, he will restore those years that have been taken. And he wants your faith to be on that. He wants you to know that he's looked through your life. He's looked through your bloodline. He's taken account of everything that was taken out and he shall restore. Now we know Job 42.10 and God restored Job's losses and God gave Job to twice as much as he had before. So when the Lord restores, he always doubles it. In Isaiah 61 verse 7 says, double honor for shame. Whenever God restores, he doubles it. Now, when God demands Satan to restore or to restitute, it's time seven. It's time seven. And so you know that a minimum double of what you lost is what he shall give you back. For those of you that lost children, for instance, guess what God is getting ready to do? Give you two for one. For those of you that lost opportunities, for those of you that lost your childhood, I think that one is a very um, pertinent one. Because for many people, because of a loss of marriage or a loss of family or fatherlessness or absentee fathers or mothers even, father wounds, mother wounds, their childhood was afflicted. Their childhood was affected by a lot of things that were not right. A lot of things that became painful. But the Lord is saying, this is why he has chosen your spouse for you. This is why he's anointed you for a particular man or a particular woman, because he knows that that person has the connection, has the heart or even the experience to restore back to you what you lost in your formative years. They've got something. If it's business, maybe your spouse has got the connection you need to take you and to accelerate you further than you would have been, amen, uh, th th that you should have been had it not been for what you went through. And you see, the story he gave me was Joseph. He said, Joseph was a man that was in prison for 13 years against his will, and he was sold into slavery. Now, Joseph was somebody who should always have been somebody to lead and to rule. We saw his leadership skills in the word of God. We saw that wherever you put him, he was a man of service. He was a man of servitude, but he's also a man who was able to lead administratively. He was a leader. Okay. So what did the Lord do? What the Lord did was through his talent, he gave him opportunity. And so he said to me with the talent, the Bible says that the gift of the man makes room for you. So he's saying your talent will give you access. Your talent will give you audience, but it is marriage that will seal the deal and give you legal rights, legal license to rule and to reign to that platform or to rule and to reign from that platform. I said, wow. So he said, a lot of people are talented and they're single and their talent has given them access. The talent has given them audience, but it is marriage that seals the deal and authenticates the, the deal for them to rule and reign from a specific platform. He uses marriage. So he used marriage in the life of um, Joseph to give him legal access to rule in Egypt. You can't become a ruler of Egypt if you're not an Egyptian. So God gave him an Egyptian wife but made sure their wife was not one of the lower class, made sure the wife was one of the royal class. So the Spirit of God was showing me, and I was studying through the word of God, that if what he does is he takes people out of what is um, um, an ordinary lifestyle and he puts them into royalty through marriage. Now he does this in Jesus because Jesus is a king. He's the king of kings. And so everyone who's born again is taken out of mediocrity, is taken out of captivity, is taken out of sin and being put into royalty. So the word of God tells us that you are a royal priesthood. First Peter 2, 2, 9, amen? You're a chosen generation. His own peculiar, a peculiar people to show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness into the kingdom of the son of love. Can you see? He took you out from wherever you were, having been alien from the commonwealth, from the covenants of promise, and he puts you into a union with Jesus. 
And when you were in the union with Jesus, instantly now as a son of God, as a child of God, you now become part of the royal family. In the same way, the Lord is saying through marriage in Christ, we have become royalty. Through your marriage, you are becoming royalty. So God has not assigned anyone to be married to anyone who is not going to take them somewhere. This is what he showed me. He said he has to catch you up. He has to catch up your husband. Your husband has been connected to women, taking them nowhere. All right. In former relationships, you were connected to men taking you nowhere or who stranded you or who derailed you. So now you have to be your the years have to be restored. The time lost has to be restored. It has to be made up for because we are growing older. God is in eternity. We are in time. So the way he does it is he connects you into a relationship that will have the resources that will have the experience, that will have maybe the heart, that will have the know-how, that will have the skill set, that will have the seed, that will have the fruitfulness. Whatever it is that both sides require, we both have got something that our husband or wife needs, our spouse needs, in order to accelerate their progress, in order to promote their progress, in order for us to rule and reign and take back the dominion that was stolen from the very beginning. Glory to God. I was like, Lord, you were just too good. You were just too good. You were just too good. And so that's what he showed me about Joseph. So with Joseph, let's just go to Joseph's story. And you see that when he had, the minute he was taken up or the minute he was taken out of prison, what happened was they called for him and then he changed himself and immediately they gave him a wife. So his wife was, was specifically chosen. She was appointed from heaven. She just looked like, oh, they gave her a wife. God was insistent. It must be that kind of wife. It can't be the kind of wife that he's now going to become, um, um, what do I call it, servant to Potiphar, another slave girl. No. It wasn't that kind of wife. It was a strategic wife. So God is saying to the men, he's given you a strategic wife. And God is saying to the woman, he's given you a strategic husband. Mm -hmm. A strategic husband to make up for what you could not have before or what the enemy took for before. Amen. So let's just go to Genesis. I don't want to read his whole story because it's a long way. But anyway, after Pharaoh's dreams, Genesis 41, verse 33, just to see how God was mindful of the 13 years of slavery that he'd been there and how he used his gift. The gift of a man makes room for him to give him access, to give him audience. But the Lord was like, the gift is not enough to establish you and give you legal license to rule and reign over a territory. It is covenant, which gives you license. And so a lot of men are out there and they have access, but they still don't have license. They don't have license to rule and reign over that territory. It is marriage that gives the license. This is why God was saying to me, I, you need the license. And then from there, legally, it is transferred. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. So Genesis 41, verse 33 to verse 41, from verse 33 to verse 41. Now, therefore, let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh, see, see the reason I'm reading this is I want you to understand that God's desire was for Joseph to be put in a place where he would have legal right to take over and to dictate what happens. You see, God does not share and so a lot of times we're praying for, we're praying for a president who, who would just allow Christians, but what God is going to do, and I believe and I declare and prophesy it, is he's going to put godly men in office, godly women in office, because we need somebody to be over the land, legal access. So that is why you see the enemies always looking to put ungodly people in office to give them legal access to enforce their wicked agenda. So we also need to pray that Lord put righteous people in office to give us legal access to enforce a righteous agenda in the name of Jesus. Amen. That's why I'm reading this verse 33. So let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh do this and let him appoint officers over the land to collect one fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt in the seven plentiful years and let them gather all the food of those good years that are coming and store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh and let them keep food in the cities. Then that food shall be as a reserve for the land, for the land, for the seven years of famine, which shall be in the land of Egypt, that the land may not perish during the famine. 
So the advice, verse 37, was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find such a one as this, a man in whom is the spirit of God? Then Pharaoh, okay, now imputed upon Joseph the position. Pharaoh said to Joseph, in as much as God has shown you all this, there is no one as discerning and wise as you. You shall be over my house and over all my people shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Jacob, see, I have set you over the land of Egypt. So the gift of a man has made ruin. He has got the appointment and he's got the um, go ahead, should I say, to be able to work and to be able to operate as an Israelite, as a Hebrew in Egypt. Yes. But what does God do? God desires even more. He desires total legal access to direct the affairs. And so now he seals it with the marriage. Praise God. So verse 42, Pharaoh took off his signet ring off his hand and put it on Joseph's hand and clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. So the first thing he gave was the covenant because the ring of Pharaoh gave him covenantal right. So it's like a marriage. It gave him covenantal rights to rule. Can you see the importance of covenant? You can't just rule like that. He had to have the seal not only of approval, and then he had to have the covenantal right. So he gave him his ring, and then he put the fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. And then he had him rise in the second chariot, and they told him to bow the knee. Amen? Then, in verse 45, he said, and Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zaphnath Paneah, and he gave him as a wife, Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On. So Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. And verse 46 says, Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Amen. And then he had his children. So when he had his children, in verse 50, and to Joseph were born two sons, before the years of famine came, when Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On, bore to him. Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for God has made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. And the name of the second he called Ephraim, for God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. Now, what happened to those children? Did they remain Egyptians or not? No. So God redeemed, amen. Out of Egypt, a tribe for himself, for Israel. Can you see what marriage does? It transfers ownership straight away. So this is what the Spirit of God was saying to me, that for him to redeem the years and for him to redeem territory, for him to redeem people groups, for him to redeem nations, for him to redeem children, for him to redeem I mean, whatever it is that the enemy took. Now from Joseph, he took his relationships. From Joseph, he took time. From Joseph, it took years. He should have been married. He was a ruler. And so he should have been promoted and be in his hometown, in his own city. He should have been one of the ones that were in the place of rulership in the royal family because the royal family and the legacy of his dad should have been passed to him. All that was stolen. So through marriage, God now took two back from Egypt. I say glory to God. Can you see? Whatever Joseph should have had, God took double from Egypt. Like Satan, you've taken from me, you've taken from the Hebrew people, you've taken from the Israelites, you've taken from um, um, Jacob, all right? Praise God. So I will take two. Thank you very much. I will restore double for his trouble. Can you see that? So this is why the Lord was saying to me that he's using these marriages to redeem the years that the enemy took in your formative years. He was 17, for goodness sake. That is formative years. This is a young boy just starting out life. Now he's sold into slavery. How many men are out there and literally starting out life and things hit their life that they don't recover from for the next 20 years? How many women are out there that through abuse or through fatherlessness or through absentee fathers or anything else, things hit their life and they don't recover from it for the next 20 years? You see, so formative years is where the enemy likes to strike. He likes to strike because we are vulnerable in our formative years. Even if formative years is just at a time whereby you're less experienced, you're still vulnerable. 
And at that time, the enemy comes in to steal, kill and destroy because he knows if he can steal from you in your formative years, it is very difficult for you to recover. But the spirit of God through marriage now positions you intentionally with someone that he can now use to cough back into your life or to bring back into your life the things that were stolen out of your life in formative years. Glory to God. Glory to God. And this seems incredible. This even seems impossible in certain circumstances. Some of us, in fact, my daughter said something which made me think. There's two people in her class that uh, they've all graduated, but they all graduated from the same class. And they're both Christian boys and they treat her like their little sister, like their baby sister. Okay. They advise her, they pray for her and everything else. That's how they treat her. And she said, mom, remember you told me that when you lost the baby before me, you knew it was a boy. And I did. I knew it was a boy. She said, well, God gave me two brothers instead. I said, wow. This is the first time she said it to me when she came this time. I said, wow, we know we just had a break, you know, from work and we were talking. And I said, Lord, I never thought of it like this. She said, Mom, as much as you lost one, God gave me two because I always wanted a brother. And God gave me two brothers that every year they pray for me. Every year they advise me. If I'm ever going through anything and I can't get hold of you and daddy, they will be the ones to help me out. Can you see what she told me? I was shocked. So the Lord reminded me, said, this is what I did. There's different ways in which God through relationship redeems. There's different ways which God through your marriage will redeem. But some of you say, oh, I've, I've been widowed before. And now, you know, how will I have more children? Well, maybe your spouse will come with them. Maybe your spouse will come with them. For some of you, you think to yourself, the opportunity to have children is gone. And then the Lord is giving you a younger man. And he says, go ahead, go ahead. Can you see? Opportunity will come around. Anything that has been taken in your formative years, the Lord is saying he is restoring it through your marriage. And he's intentional about the position and the person that he's putting you in the bloodline of because there's a legacy that has to be restored even back to the body of Christ. There's a legacy that was stolen out of the body of Christ. And through your marriage, the Lord shall redeem it and restitute you and himself. Glory to God. Amen. So that's just one instance. Another instance I wanted to go to was um, Esther. Now she lost her childhood in terms of she was an orphan, right? So the Lord obviously gave her um, Mordecai to raise her as her uncle and also as her um, advisor. But what did the Lord do for her? The Lord took her out of being an orphan or like um, Hannah said, from the ash heap of being an orphan and put her and seated her with princess. So again, as a woman, she's the last kind of woman that you'd ever think will become a queen. Where will she get the opportunity to become a queen? But the Lord did it through marriage. Through marriage, he redeemed her destiny. Amen. She was put into the bloodline of royalty. And we know that she had Darius as her son. Praise the Lord. And so when it says that Esther found favor Esther chapter two, let me sing. Verse 15. Now the turn came for Esther, the daughter of Abigail, Abihel, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as his daughter to go into the king. She requested nothing, but what Haggai, the king's eunuch, the custodian of the woman advised. And Esther obtained favor in the sight of all who saw her. So Esther was taken to King Ahasuerus into his royal palace in the 10th month, which is the month of Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign. The king loved Esther more than all the other women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins. So he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Then the king made a great feast, the feast of Esther, for all his officials and servants, and he proclaimed a holiday in the provinces and gave gifts according to the generosity of the king. Now we all know that as an orphan, you miss out on a lot of experiences. So that's the first thing that I realized. The pain of the experiences of being celebrated. The pain of the experiences that other children would have had, all right, from their mom and dad. She missed out on those things. Now, I believe that Mordecai would have celebrated her and would have helped her and would have blessed her, but it's not the same as what she would have wanted. But the Lord made sure that through marriage, he restored everything back to her. He restored her dignity. He restored her grace. He restored the opportunity and he put her into royalty. Isn't that beautiful? 
That is just so beautiful. That is just so beautiful. Another thing that really comes out to me is they said she was his uncle. He took her as a daughter. But again, Mordecai raised her in purity. And so she used that to her favor. And so I realized that the gift of God again for Esther made room for her. It made room for her. She had audience. But the Lord gave her the wisdom and the favor to seal the deal through what? Marriage. And the Lord did that in order to what? Save many people alive. And we see that in, in Esther 414, that she said, okay, fast for me, I'll go to the king. If I perish, I perish. But when she went to the king in Esther 5, from verse 1 to 3, she went to the king. He saw the queen in her royal you know, um, garments, royal robes, and he gave her favor. Um, excuse me. And that was the beginning of her restoring and redeeming the entire nation of Shushan, of the Jews, from Haman from the attack of Haman. So I'm just saying this to show you that, that God was mindful of the social aspect of her life. God was also mindful, amen, of the spiritual aspect of her life. And God was also mindful of the opportunity that was given her. And I've noticed in many of these things, and the same thing with David, if we're going to go to the story of David, but you see in the same story of David, that it was the gift that gave audience. It was the gift that gave access, but it was the marriage that seals the deal and gives you the territory through the person assigned to him. Because he marries Michelle. And if he didn't marry Michelle, he wouldn't have had the territory of royalty. So all of these are stories for you to understand the importance of you marrying as a man and as a woman, the ones that the Lord reveals to you. Because God is thinking about you. He's thinking about the things that you lost, the things that you've grieved over. The things that you've thought have gone forever, the Lord is making sure to factor them in back into your life. He's making sure to restitute them back into your life, down to opportunities of your, that were stolen from your formative years. May the Lord be praised for this word, I'm telling you, in the name of Jesus. So she obtained favor in the sight of all who saw her, because again, she'd been taught. But one of the things the Lord gave her, which was a gift, out honor, yes, but he gave her beauty. He gave her beauty. He gave her beauty. And then obviously he gave her purity because she listened to the advice of Mordecai and she maintained her purity, her chastity, and that gave her the access. So can you see, God will use everything that people use to honor him and to serve him in order to present them and position them well. So there's nothing Satan has stolen from you down to Adam and Eve that God did not restore. I forgot about Eve. I forgot to tell you about Eve's one. Eve's one, remember, she lost her husband, she lost the territory. Okay. When I say husband, they were still together, but the, you, you know, the intimacy between husband and wife based on that sweet spot, Genesis 2.25 was no longer there, but you know, she lost the domain and a lot of other things. And then we see in Genesis 4 that Adam knew if she conceived and then she had Cain, she had Abel and Cain killed Abel. But then this, the word of God tells us that Adam knew his wife again. So one thing God was showing me with us, he will use marriage to give you another opportunity. You lost one opportunity. You lost one child. He will give you another seed again. You lost one opportunity. He will give you that opportunity again. You lost a man um, childhood. He will give you back your childhood again. Whatever it is you've lost, he will give you back that thing again. Even in the time of Adam and Eve, they were still married. But of course, one son had been killed. So what did the Lord do? Genesis 4, 25 to 26. It says, and Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and named him Seth, appointed. That means appointed. For God has appointed another seed for me instead of Abel, whom Cain killed. And as for Seth, to him also was born, and he named him Enoch. Then men began to call on the name of the Lord. Amen. So before we go to David, I want to just show you the importance of what that scripture just said. Because you see, when you read the bloodline of Jesus from Luke chapter four, let me just go back. This is where I started actually the whole study. I realized that the Lord was so intentional. The genealogy of Jesus Christ is in Luke chapter three and it goes from verse 23 all the way down to verse 28. And it's at that point in verse 38 that you see the son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. So it was from that point the Lord began to show me that, listen, who you marry matters because your legacy, your bloodline is going to issue forth. So Jesus, even though Satan came in to steal Abel, 
and steal the opportunity for a righteous seed. What did God do? He gave her another seed again in order to protect and in order to produce another bloodline through which Jesus can come. Another instance, I'm going to go back again in Luke 3. Another instance in Luke 3 is um, Luke 3.31. And it's given the men, okay, through whom Jesus came, the genealogy of the men that came. It says here in Luke 3.31, the son of Milia, the son of Menang, the son of Matata, Matata, the son of Nathan, the son of David. So I said, Nathan or Solomon? Nathan. Now remember God had told Solomon, if you will honor me and you will maintain your walk before me, you will never fail to have somebody on the throne. Remember? A son on the throne. Because David came through the lineage of Judah. But we all know that Solomon loved many wives. So yes, he built the temple, but he also lost the kingdom 11, you know, most of the kingdom because of his sexual immorality and his promiscuity. The Lord in the end got fed up and said, no. All right. And took the tribes away from him and took the, yes, the different tribes away from him and said, I will hand the tribes over to a servant of yours because you have gone into idolatry. So what did the Lord do? He simply diverted the bloodline. So he said, yes, Solomon built me the temple, but now that the legacy Okay, the blessing of the legacy has been corrupted. I will pass it through somebody else. So this is why marriage is so important. Because what happens is when the enemy steals it here, the, end, the Lord has to find who should I pass the blessing through in order to restore everything the enemy has stolen from that bloodline back to the bloodline. So when it was corrupted through Solomon, he put it through Nathan. And I said, God, can you see the importance of walking uprightly before God. Because Solomon forfeited his position the same way Esau did. Esau should have been the one it went through. But because again, he was profane and he was fornicator, according to Hebrews chapter 12. And so God passed it through Jacob. And in Solomon's case, yes, he was wise. God left his wisdom and so that he could write down his wisdom for other people to learn. Remember Romans 15, 4. He said, everything that has been written has been written for your learning that you through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might find hope. And so Solomon's life is meant to be a testimony to men. If you continue in promiscuity, you will miss out on your divine opportunity. If you continue, amen, to, 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 to fornicate and to be profane. Now this is for men or for women, by the way, but especially for men because they carry the seed of the generations. Guess what will happen? God will bypass the plan and the purpose he had for that man. And he will put it through somebody else. But he will find somebody in the bloodline to redeem it and bring it back into the, into, the, into the body of Christ. So God is saying through marriage, he redeems. Through marriage, he takes back into your life and into your bloodline what Satan stole. So everything that has been stolen, not only in your life, in your formative years, but even in your father's life, your mother's life. The Lord is saying he looks for people to receive double of everything that the devil took out in order to redeem the bloodlines for the name of Jesus Christ. Praise God. I thought that was very powerful. I thought that was very, very powerful. So let's just go back to first Samuel. Now we know that David was a shepherd boy. We know that David was not even considered. I wouldn't say considered a son, but he wasn't endeared to his family. Okay. As one of the sons, he wasn't even considered to be somebody worthy of being in royalty. But what did the Lord do? The Lord basically gave him access through gifting the same way because he was a worshiper and he was able to kill Goliath and then gave him audience. And then out of that, he sealed the deal through the marriage of Misha. Misha. But I want to just first of all, read first Samuel 25. Okay. So first Samuel 25, for the sake of Abigail, Abigail is a woman who was denied a righteous husband. The Bible says, in fact, when you read it here, let's read in verse two. It says, um, verse two to verse three, okay? Now there was a man in Maon whose business was in Carmel and the man was very rich. He had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats and he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. The name of the man was Nabal and the name of his wife, Abigail. And she was a woman of good understanding and beautiful appearance, but the man was harsh, and evil in his doings, he was of the house of Caleb. 
So in those days, many times women were married and they were married by arrangement. So she ends up being a woman who's beautiful, being a woman who's got good understanding, being a woman who's meek with a mean man, with a mean man, with a wicked man. Now we know what happened and that Nabal in the end was struck by God because he was foolish and he was prideful and David was on his way to kill them because he was upset. But she managed to interfere and intercept David and stop him from avenging himself. All right. So we know that. That's what happened in the entire story through her meekness, through her wisdom, through her understanding. But his eyes saw, this is a beautiful woman. This is the kind of woman that should be married to a king. So in honor of what she did, in safeguarding his destiny, God also remembers her and God also rewarded her by promoting her into royalty. Again, God gave her again a second charge. The first one was struck down. But the second one was a man of royalty. He says here in verse um, um, 39 to 40, okay? It says, so when David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, blessed be the Lord who has pleaded the cause of my reproach from the hand of Nabal and has kept his servant from evil. For the Lord has returned the wickedness of Nabal on his own head. And David sent and proposed to Abigail to take her as his wife. When the servants of David had come to Abigail at Kamal, they spoke to her saying, David sent us to you to ask you to become his wife. And obviously the name was, the answer was yes. Okay. She became his wife. So I've been going through a lot of these um, studies and for the sake of time, I don't want to go through everything, but you see that the Lord is mindful of each individual who he connects them to in order for them to get married, in order not only to give them um, an, a purpose partner or a spouse, but in order to settle them in an area that the enemy defrauded them out of in their formative years or in their former years. Glory to God. And Abigail is included. Now, remember I said to you spiritually, spiritually in Christ, Nabal many times is in the same man. The king and the fool are in the same man. So God strikes one down, the Nabal, so that the David can live. So when we're doing our prayers and the Lord is insisting for you to pray for someone, many times people think, why can't God just strike him? Many times God is striking the Nabal. He's striking the foolish part. He's striking that down. He's dealing with that part strongly because when the fool dies, the king lives. And it is the king that can see you as his queen. It is the king that can acknowledge, I need you to be my queen. And it is the king that sent the proposal. Amen. So this is what is such a blessing. So whichever way you look at it, practically or spiritually, the Lord is mindful of everything you have gone through and what's been defrauded away from you and ensures to redeem it and to restore it back to you and to honor you in the name of Jesus. Amen. In order for the devil to understand, whatever you take from me, I will take double back. I will come back for it. I won't just allow it to go. Glory to God. Now we can look at the story of David. Now the story of David, I think is so interesting because the story of David is such that not only was he redeemed out of being a shepherd boy, his dignity was redeemed, but also they thought he would be killed when it came time for him to be married. Yeah, let's go for 1 Samuel 16. 1 Samuel 16, okay? Um, verse Verse one, verse one. Now the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul? I just want you to see the replacement or the substitution that God brings. Okay. Saul and David. Now the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul? Seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel. So this thing about territory is important. I've rejected him from reigning over Israel. So the Lord is not just looking for a man or just looking for a woman or just looking for a husband or just looking for a wife. He's looking for a position for people to rule and reign. Revelations 5, 9 to 10. Never forget it. That you may, we, we may rule and reign on the earth, not in heaven, on the earth. So I've rejected him. He doesn't fit the mold. So for some of you, this was where the divorce came. For some of you, this is where the separation came. 
Yes, God hates divorce, but people of God, I've told you several times that there is one thing that God told me when he commanded me to release my husband and said, you're going to have to go through divorce. He said, I reserve the right. I said, let no man separate, but I reserve the right. And so I tell people, you don't jump out of your marriage. But for some people, if you stood in righteousness with the Lord and done right by your spouse, and done right by God, if God sees that your destiny is going to be deviated or destroyed, many times he will release you or he, you will find that they will go. And it does also tell us in 1 Samuel 7, First uh, Corinthians 7, that if the unbeliever will not live with you in peace, let them go. Okay, so there are very few circumstances, but God does do it and he did it to me and he's done it to others that I know about. So he does do it under very stringent um, circumstances, but he does do it. Now, when he does it, you don't jump into any marriage. This is where people go wrong. They think you can just choose who you want. Well, you can, but the wise would be better to wait on God and see what the Lord has to say. Because you see, marriage is supposed to safeguard your destiny. And marriage is supposed to safeguard the destiny of God's people and of God's purposes. That is another purpose of marriage. I say all the time, the individuals are called, but the marriage, the union is also called. So it's important. We don't just jump. And this is one of the circumstances you can see. The same God that anointed Saul is now coming back to say, I've rejected Saul. I always say the way you will know God has substituted is he will bring another word. God does that a lot. He did that in the book of Numbers. He said, yes, I've told you, I'm taking you all into the promised land. But because you failed me 10 times, now you're coming back with a bad report. He says, I'm sorry, but now I'm putting you in a curse and I'm dispossessing you all. Only the ones 20 years and older. So anytime God wants to overdo or overrule a former word or a former promise, he brings another word because he's of his word. He's the living word. He did the same thing to Eli. He told Eli, I, yes, I gave you a covenant of Levi. I gave you the covenant of the priesthood, but far be it for me to continue with this covenant, seeing what your sons are doing, because I honor those to honor me, but those who dishonor me, I lightly esteem. So he brought another word. And the Bible says, a man of God came. We don't know the name of the man of God, but a man of God came and said, you know what? The former deal is over. That's how God brings substitution. He comes back himself and says the former deal is over. The former person is no longer acceptable. I've now rejected them. It is only at that point that God will now realign you. That's why I say that divine substitution begins with God. It doesn't begin with us. I know people find it difficult and they say, if God says something, it will come to pass. I said, if God says something and he finds that the people no longer want to walk according to the criteria, he will give them time and chance and time and chance. If they insist on disobedience, he will find a replacement and he will now bring back a word to undo the first word and to reinstitute the second word. That is how God changes his mind. Amen. So you have to take the whole counsel of God because if you don't take the whole counsel of God, you will not understand the character of God. No person will hold God bound. No person. The word of God tells us, Proverbs 21, 30, there is no counsel, there is no wisdom, amen, that is, um, what is it? There is no power, no counsel, no wisdom that can prevail against the Lord. None. No person will hold God bound. Even when you see in the book of Isaiah, he said there was no man, there was no intercessor so his own arm brought salvation. No person will hold God bound. He has given us protocols. He has given us keys to the kingdom, but he's always made sure there is a way. That's why he says with God, nothing is impossible because he holds the keys. He is sovereign. He knows exactly how everything operates. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And so you better believe it that he's put in the checks and balances. So he understands it. So he wants to do everything with us and through us. But if we insist not, he's already got another way. Amen. Praise God. So here comes Saul. And even though we know that he didn't want Saul, the people wanted Saul. However, God gave them the permissive will. And then he, obviously it did not wake up. He warned them. This is what's going to happen. But he still had to follow protocol. He couldn't just say, you know what, get rid of him. He had to follow protocol because he was anointed into office. So to, in order for him to be taken out of office, 
he had to re-anoint somebody else. So he came to Samuel, who is the prophet. The prophet is the mouthpiece of God, is the servant of God. So the prophet is the one that instituted spiritually or in, imparted the spiritual grace upon Saul. So the Lord had to use the same prophet to put that grace upon David and make the transfer. Amen. So the Lord said to him, how long will you mourn for Saul? Seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel. Now, this is important because like I said to you, this is all part of marriage. Who, how we're going to rule and reign. Go, I'm sending you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I've provided myself a king among his sons. Now, he went to Jesse and then we see now in 1 Samuel 16, verse 12. So he sent and brought him in. This is David now. Now he was ruddy with bright eyes and good looking. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. Immediately the spirit of God came upon David. It left Saul. The next verse tells us the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and a distressing spirit from the Lord troubled him. So this is why you know that there's been an exchange. Instantly. And the spirit of God showed me many years ago, two kings in his sight never rule over the same territory. Never. So the instant God took the anointing off. Amen. And put it on David. It came off Saul. Now Saul was physically in the seat, but David was ruling in the spirit. That is how powerful substitution is. Divine substitution. That is how powerful divine replacement is. People can still be in a seat, but dethroned. Because God has put the anointing on his choice. That is why we follow the spirit. We do not follow the flesh. Because if you follow the flesh, you will follow the ones that are physically there. And they're physically there. There's a physical woman there, but she's no longer the wife. She doesn't have the grace or the anointing. Or it could be the husband. He doesn't have the grace or the anointing. But now you have to follow who is the spirit pointing at. Because it's the spirit that will tell you who has been appointed for you to rule and to reign. It is the spirit that will confirm to you the one who's been anointed to take that territory. If you enter in in the flesh, guess what? They have the position, they have the name, they have the title, but you cannot rule with them. That's why he said it is important that you marry the ones he points to because that person will take you somewhere. And I said, God, the wisdom of God is something we have to learn to respect. The wisdom of God in his choices, we must learn to respect it. So the spirit of God came upon David. It departed from Saul. Saul was still, you know, showcasing himself as king. He didn't have the capacity anymore because two kings can never rule over one kingdom. And so it is in marriage. Two kings can never rule over one queen. So it is in, 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 um, in community or so it is in neighborhoods. They say one king, only one king can rule. And this is why when you saw Joseph, uh, Joshua fighting, the Bible says 31 kings were taken down. And for every king that was taken down, there was a tribe that came in and took over that territory. So that is the principle of warfare. So God is looking to redeem nations, territories, legacies, families, amen, ethnicities, nationalities through marriage. But you must be careful that you marry the anointed one, the appointed one, the Seth, the one that God gives you again. Amen. It must be careful. Praise God. So that's why I wanted to come to David last because it's vital we pick up this understanding. Praise God. Now, we know he killed Goliath. And when he killed Goliath, Misha loved him, right? It's 1 Samuel 18. 1 Samuel 18. I wanted to jump over to 1 Samuel 18. He killed Goliath. So again, by gifting, he had access. He had um, audience with King Saul. Okay? And he was given a position. But God still had to seal the deal to give him legal right or legal license to rule as a royal through marriage. So I realized that every time you see God giving you access, don't just be happy about the access. Use the access now, amen, to be established through marriage. This is how the kings of old in history used to secure their territory. Through marriage, you know, kings and queens will be, especially in Europe, they will be marrying each other in order to gain access, audience, and then license to rule over a territory through marriage, or to receive a certain inheritance through marriage. 
So it's important because we get so happy with open doors. We get so happy with access, but understand it is through marriage that you're authenticated to now have the legal right to rule the territory. So we have to go for the marriage. This is why God is fighting for marriage. This is why Satan is fighting against marriage as well. Amen. So now he's got the access, he's got the audience and most men, especially single men, they're happy right there. Oh, I'm now working in the palace. I'm now working with the president. I'm now working with the king. That's where they're very, very happy. God is not happy at all. He's like, son, get married, <laughs> get married. You haven't sealed anything. You can be cast out tomorrow. You can be demoted. But if you're married, there is a legal license. There is access that is given now to an inheritance and to a territory. So first Samuel 18, this is where I want you to see how David marries Mika and uh, Michelle. Okay. First Samuel 8, already from verse 17. And then it goes down to uh, verse 27. Yes. From verse 17 to verse 27. This is my last bit. Okay. Now Michelle, Saul's daughter loved David and they told Saul and the thing pleased him. So Saul said, I will give her to him that she may be a snare to him and that the hand of this Philistine may be against him. Therefore, Saul said to David a second time, you shall be my son-in-law today. And Saul commanded his servants, communicate with David secretly and say, look, the king has delight in you and all his servants love you. Now, therefore, become this king's son-in-law. Persuade him, basically cajole him. Verse 23. So Saul's servants spoke those words in the hearing of David. And David said, does it seem to you a light thing to be a king's son-in-law, seeing I am poor and lightly esteemed man? And the servants of Saul told him, saying, in this manner, David spoke. Then Saul said, thus you shall say to David, the king does not desire any dowry. That was his worry. That was his concern. Bride price. How am I going to pay this? Okay. The, excuse me, the king does not desire any dowry, but 100 foreskins of the Philistines to take vengeance on the king's enemies. But Saul thought to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines. So when his servants told David these words, it pleased David well to become the king's son-in-law. Now the days had not expired. Therefore, David arose and went, he and his men, and killed 200 men of the Philistines. And David brought their foreskins and they gave them in full count to the king that he might become the king's son-in-law. Then Saul gave him Mishael, his daughter, as a wife. The deal was sealed for that marriage now, for royalty. His legal entry for royalty was on his wedding day. Can you see? What the Spirit of God showed me about this is, yes, he gave him access at first through gifting. Secondly, through marriage, he sealed the deal and gave him legal license to become royalty. But he said it was from that point that Saul understood what I thought would kill him actually positioned him to prosper and to take over. And the Spirit of God gave me a word for some of your husbands and for some men that what the devil thought will kill you is what God has used to position you and give you access for you to prosper. What the devil thought will kill you especially the men, because he said he set Saul up, he set David up amen, in such a way he should have died. But because the Lord was with David, the very thing that they said to David to do in order amen, to gain access or to get married to Michal is the very thing God protected the man from. And that is when Saul knew, my gosh, the Lord is with this man. And the Lord said to me, this is exactly the process many of your husbands are going through. They have gone through certain things that should have taken them out. And he's saying, God positioned you as a woman who loves him, praying for him, because he will come out and he will come through. And the very thing Satan thought will kill him and take him out has positioned him to take over. And so shall he take over in Jesus' name. Imagine. He did it and nothing came on him. He was not harmed and he married her. And so this is why the Lord is saying, be very careful about discounting the one God has given you. Because for some of you, your husband is going through perilous things. <laughs> He's going through perilous times. Amen. Take vengeance on the, on the, on the, on the, the enemies. And he gave it to him in full count. But the spirit of God said, listen, I am wiser than Satan. What the enemy used to set him up, to trap him, to snare him, to divert him. He will survive it. 
he will come out of it and he will be positioned to rule and reign because the Lord too has positioned him through you and through marriage so that the two of you will rule and reign together in Christ. God bless his word in Jesus name. Amen. And so I say all this to let you know that if you read through, and like I said, I will go through more of the examples later. But if you read through from the man's side or you read through from the woman's side, you will see the Lord saying that I am redeeming the years that the enemy has stolen, has broken, uh, stolen from you in your formative years. And I'm redeeming them through marriage. Irrespective of what you lost, the Lord has accounted it or factored it in with your spouse. And so make sure you do not, you honor God with your choice, basically. Honor God with your choice. That's all I can say. Because I look back now and I wonder, I said, oh, this is why he said to me, greater glory. Remember, I was going to get married before. And he said, when we got to a certain point and things were getting a little bit funny. And he said, release this one. And I came back and told you guys, okay, I've decided to release this one. But later on, he said, for greater glory. Now I can see what I would have missed out on if I continued with the format. There were certain blessings. There's no way I will see today if I had not married my husband. And there's certain things, there's no way he would have found if he went off with the other woman he, that he thought he was going to marry. Absolutely not. Because there's certain connections that we both had. There are certain resources that we both had that without each other, we could not be or have what God has given us and God is going to continue to give us if it was not for the both of us. That is how specific God is. And so you don't want to forfeit the years that the enemy has stolen in the name of a spouse. No way. With your spouse, you want all things to be added. Amen? In Jesus' name. Just like with Jesus, the Bible tells us that every good thing is added. That he who did not spare his only begotten son, that delivered him up from us all, for us all. How much more will he not with him give us all things? In the book of Romans 8, he will give you everything. So with your marriage... The Lord is giving you everything. Now, for me, that also means that, especially for those of you that are worried about um, children, you have to know that God has factored in your children. Look at what he did to Joseph. God has factored in your children. He's factored in the seed. He's factored in the legacy. Down to Abigail. Look at what she went through. No child from the first marriage. Her circumstance, a harsh man, an evil man. He now gives her a worshiper, a warrior, a prophet, a priest, a king, and make her motherhood on top. There is nothing Satan has taken from you that the Lord will not restore back to you. But you have to believe it. The word of the Lord has come for you to believe it, for you to receive it, for you to accept it, for you to be, to, to be emboldened to understand that God knows exactly what you suffered. And also for you to defeat that thinking that there are certain things you can no longer enjoy because of your age and stage. It's a lie from the pit of hell. Amen. In Jesus name. So Father, we just want to say thank you for today. This is a word for the weekend. And I just believe that for those of you who um, receive this word, accept it, it will really encourage you and it will embolden you to know that I'm going to get everything that the enemy has, got, has taken away from me in the name of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. And like I said to the Lord, 10, five, Jesus, not high five, 10, five. 10-5, because this one is a slam dunk. It's a slam dunk to Satan. 10-5. I said, Lord, 10-5. Amen. <laughs> I'm not giving you high five. 10-5, because it's a slam dunk. So many things the enemy has taken from me. So many things he took from my husband. So, so many things he took from my bloodline. Everything, claim it back in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you because his face to shine upon you. Be gracious to you all. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you all peace. I love you all so much. God bless. Yeah, somebody's saying, good job, Papa. Come on now. I'm telling you, you have to celebrate him. I said, Lord, 10-5. This one, 10-5 for everything you're doing for us. God bless you. Have a wonderful weekend. I'll see you again soon. Love you. Bye. Oh.